Welcome everyone. We are having a, well, a treat today. This is something called The Improvement of the Mind by Mr. Isaac Watts. And it used to be common education for children in America in the 1800s, early 1900s. This is part one, directions for the obtainment of useful knowledge. Introduction. No man is obliged to learn and know everything. This can neither be sought nor required, for it is utterly impossible. Yet all persons are under some obligation to improve their own understanding or comprehension. Otherwise, it will be barren desert or a forest overgrown with weeds and brambles. Universal ignorance or infinite errors will overspread the mind which is utterly neglected and lies without any cultivation. Skill in the sciences or knowledges is indeed the business and profession of but a small part of mankind. But there are many others placed in such an exalted rank in the world as allows them much leisure and large opportunities to cultivate their reason and to beautify and enrich their minds with various knowledge. Even the lower orders of men have particular callings in life, wherein they ought to acquire a right degree of skill. And this is not to be done well without thinking and reasoning about them. The common duties and benefits of society, which belong to every man living, as we are social creatures, and even our native and necessary relations to a family, a neighborhood or government, oblige all persons whatsoever to use their reasoning powers upon a thousand occasions. Every hour of existence calls for some regular exercise of our judgment as to time and things, persons and actions without a prudent and discreet determination in matters before us. We shall be plunged into perpetual errors in our conduct. Now that which should always be practiced must at some time be learned. Besides, every son and daughter of Adam has a most important concern in the affairs of the existence to come. And therefore, it is a matter of the highest moment for everyone to comprehend to judge, and to reason right about the things of religion. It is vain for any to say we have no leisure time for it. The daily intervals of time, the vacancies from necessary labor, <clears throat> together with one yom or day in seven in the Nazarene world, allows sufficient time for this. If men would but apply themselves to it with half so much zeal and diligence as they do to the trifles and amusements of this existence, and it would turn to infinitely better account. Thus it appears to be the necessary duty and the interest of every person living to improve his comprehension, to inform his judgment, to treasure up useful knowledge and to acquire the skill of good reasoning as far as his station, capacity, and circumstances furnish, furnish him with proper means for it. Our mistakes in judgment may plunge us into much folly and guilt in practice. By acting without thought or reason, we dishonor the Elohim that made us reasonable creatures. We often become injurious to our neighbors, kindred, or friends, and we bring sin and misery upon ourselves. For we are accountable to Elohim, our judge, for every part of our irregular and mistaken conduct, where he has given us sufficient advantages to guard against those mistakes. All right, chapter one, general rules and etc. General rules for the improvement of knowledge. Rule number one, deeply possess your mind with the vast importance of a good or tov judgment and the rich and 
inestimable advantage of right reasoning. Review the instances of your own misconduct in existence. Think seriously with yourselves how many follies and sorrows you had escaped and how much guilt and misery you had prevented. If from your early years you had but taken due pains to judge aright concerning persons, times, and things. This will awaken you with lively vigor to address yourselves to the work of improving your reasoning powers and seizing every opportunity and advantage for that end. Number two, consider the weaknesses, frailties, and mistakes of man's nature in general, which arise from the very con constitution of an inner being united to an animal body or a corporal body and subjected to many inconveniences thereby. Consider many additional weaknesses, mistakes, and frailties which are derived from our original apostasy and fall from a state of innocence. How much our powers of comprehending are yet more darkened, enfeebled and imposed upon by our senses, our fancies, our unruly passions, and etc. Consider the depth and difficulty of many truths and the flattering appearances of falsehood, whence arises an infinite variety of dangers to which we are exposed in our judgment of things. Read with greediness those authors that treat of the doctrine of prejudices, prepossessions, and springs of error on purpose to make your inner being watchful on all sides that it suffer itself as far as possible to be imposed upon by none of them. Number three, a slight view of things so monumentous is not sufficient. You should therefore contrive and practice some proper methods to acquaint yourself with your own ignorance and to impress your mind with a deep and painful sense of how low and in perfect degrees of your present knowledge, that you may be incited with labor and activity to pursue after greater measures. Among others, you may find some such methods as these successful. One, take a wide survey now and then of the vast and unlimited regions of learning. Let your meditations run over the names of all the sciences with their numerous branchings and innumerable particular themes of knowledge, and then reflect how few of them you are acquainted with and in any tolerable degree, or within any tolerable degree. The most learned of mortals will never find occasion to act over again what is fabled of Alexander the Great, that when he had conquered what was called the Eastern world, he wept for want of more worlds to conquer. The worlds of science or knowledge are immense and endless. And I'll add some of them are unprofitable. Number two, think what a numberless variety of questions and difficulties there are belonging even to that particular science in which you have made the greatest progress and how few of them there are in which you have arrived at a final an undoubted certainty, excepting only those questions in the pure and simple mathematics, whose theorems are demonstrable and leave scarce any doubt, and yet even in the pursuit of some few of these, mankind have been strangely bewildered. Three, spend a few thoughts sometimes on the puzzling inquiries concerning vacuums and atoms both of which don't actually exist in nature. The doctrine of infinities, indivisibles, and incommensurables. In geometry, wherein there appear some insolvable difficulties, do this on purpose to give you a more sensible impression of the poverty of your comprehension and the imperfection of your knowledge. This will teach you what a vain thing it is to fancy that you know all things and will instruct you to think modestly of your present attainments when every dust of the earth and every inch of empty space 
surmounts to your comprehension and triumphs over your presumption. Arithmo had been bred up to accounts all his life or existence and thought himself a complete master of numbers. But when he was pushed hard to give a square root of the number two, he tried at it and labored long in minimal fractions till he confessed there was no end of the inquiry. And yet he learned so much modesty by this perplexing question that he was afraid to say it was an impossible thing. It is some good degree of improvement or tobe degree of improvement when we are afraid to be positive. And that means to be self-assured. Number four, read the accounts of those vast treasures of knowledge which some of the dead have possessed and some of the existing do possess. Read and be astonished at the almost incredible advances which have been made in science. Acquaint yourself with some persons of great learning that by converse among them and comparing yourself with them, you may acquire a mean or poor opinion of your own attainments and may thereby be animated with new zeal to equal them as far as possible or to exceed. Thus let your diligence be quickened by a generous and laudable emulation. If Valinus had never met with Secrocio, or Sicrorio and Pallades, sorry, I'm messing those up, Pallades, he had never imagined himself a mere novice in philosophy, nor ever set himself to study in good earnest. Remember this that if upon some few superficial acquirements you value, exalt, and swell yourself, as though you were a man of learning already, you are thereby building a most unpassable barrier against all improvement. You will lie down and indulge idleness and rest yourself contented in the midst of deep and shameful ignorance. Multiad scientium pervencissent C C or C C Yelic Persevius non Patusent I Patasent. I can't say Latin in any respectable fashion whatsoever, so I apologize for that. Normally he'll have the translation right afterwards. Rule number four. Presume not too much upon a bright genius, a ready wit, and good parts. For this, without labor and study, will never make a man of knowledge and wisdom, or chokmah. This has been an unhappy temptation to persons of a vigorous and gay or happy fancy. To despise learning and study, they have been acknowledged to shine in an assembly and sparkle in a discourse on common topics. And thence they took it into their heads to abandon reading and labor and grow old in ignorance. But when they had lost their vivacity of animal nature and youth, they become or they became stupid and sottish, even to contempt and ridicule. Lucidus and Scintillo are young men of this stamp. They shine in conversation. They spread their native riches before the ignorant. They pride themselves in their own lively images of fancy and imagine themselves wise and learned. But they had best avoid the presence of a skillful, sorry, of the skillful, and least the test of reasoning. And I would advise them once a day to think forward a little what a contemptible figure they will make in age. The witty men sometimes have sense enough to know their own foible, and therefore they craftily shun the attacks of argument and boldly pretend to despise and renounce them because they are conscious of their own ignorance and inwardly confess their want of acquaintance with the skill of reasoning. And if you are anywhere familiar with the recognitions of Clement, 
in there, it's the discourse bet between, uh, right at the beginning in book one, you have Clement's introduction, and then where he is introduced to Kepha. And from there, they go to the discourses or debates that Kepha had had with Simon the magician. And when you look at the way that Kepha behaves, he's following all the qualities and attributes that are recommended here. And he actually speaks on the very topics that are also mentioned later on. And then on the reverse of that, the, the mannerisms, the disposition and the way that Simon the magician is acting and speaking in relation to Kepha is the reverse things in here that you want to avoid. So it's rather interesting. And if you read those books, you'll be able to see it's pretty amazing. But I'll try to point those out more as we go through and then maybe some other time we'll actually do an in-depth study between comparing this with scripture and the other writings. But rule number five, as you are not to fancy yourself a learned man because you are prospered or blessed with a ready wit, so neither must you imagine that large and laborious reading and a strong memory can denominate you truly wise. And this is something that keeps me in check too. Just because I have a lot of head knowledge doesn't mean I know how to use it correctly. What that excellent critic has determined when he decided the question, whether wit or study makes the best poet, may well be applied to every sort of learning. And here we have it in, <clears throat> this is Latin again, if I know, if I am seeing it correctly, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip reading that and just do the English translation. It says, concerning poets, there has been contest, whether they're made by art or nature best. But if I may presume in this affair, among the rest, my judgment to declare. No art without a genius will avail, and parts without the help of art will fail. But both ingredients jointly must unite, or verse will never shine with a transcendent light. It is meditation and studious thought. It is the exercise of your own reason and judgment upon all you read that gives good sense even to the best genius and affords your comprehension the truest improvement. A boy of strong memory may repeat a whole book of Iliad or Elucid, yet be no ge ge geometrician. I didn't say his name right, I apologize. For he may not be able perhaps to demonstrate one single theorem. Memin, mem, Memorino has learned half the Bible by heart and has become a living concordance and a speaking index to theological foils or folios. And yet he comprehends little of Elohim. A well-furnished library and a capacious memory are indeed of singular use toward the improvement of the mind. But if all your learning be nothing else but a mere amassment of what others have written, without a due penetration into the meaning, and without a judicious, judicious choice and determination of your own sentiments, I do not see what title your head has to true learning above your shelves. Though you have read philosophy and theology, morals and metaphysics in abundance, and every other art and science. Yet if your memory is the only faculty employed with the neglect of your reasoning powers, you can justly claim no higher character but that of a good historian of the sciences. Here note, many of the foregoing advices are more peculiarly proper for those who are conceited of their abilities and are ready to entertain a high opinion of themselves. But a modest, humble youth of a good genius should not suffer himself to be discouraged by any of these considerations. They are designed only as a spur to diligence and a guard against vanity and pride. And I'll be honest, when I first read it, some of it pricked my conscience as well. 
Rule number six. Be not so weak as to imagine that, a, that an existence of learning is an existence of laziness and ease. Dare not give up yourself to any of the learned professions unless you are resolved to labor hard at study and can make it your delight and the joy of your existence, according to the motto of our late Lord Chancellor King, labor ispis volpitus, or voltes. It is no idle thing to be a scholar indeed, a man much addicted to luxury and pleasure, recreation and pastime, should never pretend to devote himself entirely to the sciences, unless his inner being be so reformed and refined that he can taste all these entertainments eminently in his closet, among his books and papers. Sobrino is a temperate man and a philosopher, and he feeds upon partridge and pheasant, venison and ragouts, or ragouts, and every delicacy in a growing comprehension and a serene and healthy inner being though he dines on a dish of sprouts and or turnips. Linguinos loved his ease and therefore chose to be brought up a scholar. He had much indolence in his temper, and as he never cared for study, he falls under universal contempt in his profession because he has nothing but the gown and the name. Number seven. Let the expectation of new discoveries as well as the satisfaction of pleasure and pleasure of known truths animate your daily industry. Do not think learning in general is arrived at its perfection or that the knowledge of any particular subject in any science cannot be improved merely because it has lined 500 or 1,000 years without improvement. The present age, by the Birakoth or blessing of Elohim, on the ingenuity and diligence of men, has brought to light such truths in natural philosophy, and such discoveries in the Shemaim and the Eretz, or earth, as seemed to be beyond the reach of man. But may there not be Sir Isaac Newton's in every science, you should never despair, therefore, of finding out that which has never yet been found, unless you see something in the nature of it which renders it unsearchable and above the reach of our facilities. Nor should a student in Elohim imagine that our age has arrived at a full comprehension of everything which can be known by the scriptures. Every age since the Reformation has thrown some further light on difficult texts and paragraphs of the Bible or scriptures, which have been long obscured by the early rise of anti mashiach And just for the record, these men were well aware still at this time that the anti mashiach was the office of the papacy and Catholicism was the falling away that they had fallen into, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth mystery Babylon, as they call it. There was no squalms about that. And as we read in here, you'll see that he contrasts quite often the negative characteristics with papists and what they were actually doing. This is, and since there are at present many difficulties and darknesses hanging about certain truths of the Nazarene religion, and since several of these relate to important doctrines, such as the origin of sin, the fall of Adam, the person of Mashiach, and it says the Baruch or the blessed Trinity. Although we know for everyone that's been watching those anti-Mashiach for dummies videos, it is explicit that the coming anti-Mashiach would be a Trinitarian. And I believe that is in the first video that you can watch on the series. So I highly recommend everyone who holds to that doctrine to watch that video. But we'll go ahead and continue. And degrees of Elohim, etc. 
which do still embarrass the minds of honest and inquiring readers. And he says it embarrasses them because there's no evidence for some of the stuff and some of the things that were being purported by counter-reformationists had no substance in scripture, but men were falling for it. All right, it says, which do still embarrass the minds of honest and inquiring readers and which make work for noisy controversy. It is certain there are several things in the scriptures or Bible yet unknown and not sufficiently explained. And it is certain that there is some way to solve these difficulties and to reconcile these seeming contradictions. And why may not a sincere searcher of the truth in the present age by labor, diligence, study, and prayer, with the best use of his reasoning powers, find out the proper solution of those knots and perplexities which have hitherto been unsolved, and which have afforded matter for angry quarreling. Happy is every man who shall be favored of Shamayim to give a helping hand towards the introduction of the Baruch Age of Light and love. Rule number eight. Do not hover always on the surface of things, nor take up suddenly with mere appearances, but penetrate into the depths of matters as far as your time and circumstances allow, especially in those things which relate to your own profession. Do not indulge yourselves to judge of things by the first glimpse or a shot and superficial or sorry or a short and superficial view of them for this will fill the mind with errors and prejudices and give it a wrong turn and ill habit of thinking and make much work for retraction sub subito is carried away with title pages so that he ventures to pronounce upon a large octo at once and to recommend it wonderfully when he has read half the preface. Another volume of controversies of equal size was discarded by him at once because it pretended to treat of the Trinity, and yet he could neither find the words essence nor substances in the first or in the 12 first pages. But Subito changes his opinions of men and books and things so often that nobody regards him. As for those sciences or those parts of knowledge, which either your profession or leisure, your inclination or your incapacity forbid you to pursue with much application or to search far into them, you must be contented with an historical and superficial knowledge of them and not pretend to form any judgment of your own on those subjects which you comprehend very imperfectly. And this is something we really, all of us, should take to heart now. Many of us hear what someone else repeats and we act like we're subject matter experts in anything when we've really done no labor or study of our own. True. Rule number nine. Once a yom or day especially in the early years of existence and study, call yourselves to an account what new ideas, what new proposition or truth you have gained, what further confirmation of known truths, and what advances you have made in any part of knowledge, and let no yom or day, if possible, pass away without some intellectual gain. Such a course well pursued must certainly advance us in useful knowledge. It is a prudent or wise proverb among the learned, borrowed from the lips and practice of a celebrated painter, Nola dies sin lina. Let no day or yom pass without one line at least. And it was a sacred or set apart rule among the, Pythag the Pythagoreans that they should every evening thrice run over the actions and affairs of the young or day and examine what their conduct had been, what they had done, 
or what they had neglected. And they assured their pupils that by this method they would make a noble progress in the path of virtue. And this is Greek to me, so we'll just read the English. It is Greek. Yes. That was a joke, sorry. So funny. Nor let soft slumber close your eyes before you've recollected thrice the train of action through the day. Where have my feet chose out their way? What have I learned wherever I've been? From all I've heard, from all I've seen. What know I more that's worth the knowing? What have I done that's worth the doing? What have I sought that I should shun? What duty have I left undone? Or into what new foils run? Follies, my apologies. These self-inquiries are the road that leads to virtue and to Elohim. I would be glad among a nation of Nazarene to find young men heartily engaged in the practice of what this heathen writer teaches. Rule number 10. Maintain a constant watch at all times against the dogmatical ruach or spirit. Fix not your assent to any proposition in a firm and unalterable manner. Tell you have some firm and unalterable ground for it. And tell you have not arrived at some clear and sure evidence. Till you have turned the proposition on all sides and searched the matter through and through so that you cannot be mistaken. And even where you may think you have full grounds of assurance, be not too early nor too frequent in expressing this assurance in too preparatory and positive a manner, remembering that man's nature is always liable to mistake in this corrupt and feeble state. A dogmatical spirit has many inconveniences attending it. As one, it stops the ears against all further reasoning upon that subject and shuts up the mind from all further improvements of knowledge. If you have resolutely fixed your opinion, though it be upon too slight and insufficient grounds, yet you will stand determined to renounce the strongest reason brought to the contrary opinion or for the contrary opinion and grow obstinate against the force of the clearest argument. Positivo is a man of this character and has often pronounced his assurance of the Cartesian vortexes. Last year, some further light broke in upon his comprehension with uncontrollable force by reading something of mathematical philosophy. Yet having asserted his former opinions in a most confident manner, he is tempted now to wink a little against the truth or to prevaricate in his discourse upon that subject. Least by admitting conviction, he should expose himself to the necessity of confessing his former folly and mistake, and he has not humility enough for that. Number two, a dogmatical ruach or spirit naturally leads us to arrogance of mind and gives a man some airs in conversation which are too haunty and assuming. Audens is a man of learning and very good company, but his infallible assurance renders his carriage sometimes insupportable. A dogmatical ruach inclines a man to be censorious of his neighbors. Every one of his own opinions appears to him written, as it were, with sunbeams, and he grows angry that his neighbor does not see it in the same light. He is tempted to disdain his correspondence as men of a low and dark comprehension because they will not believe what he does. Furio goes further in this wild tract and charges those who refuse his notions with willful obstinacy and vile hypocrisy. He tells them boldly that they resist the truth and sin against their consciences. These are the men that, when they deal in controversy, delight in reproaches. They abound in tossing about absurdity and stupidity among their brethren. 
they cast the imputation of heresy and nonsense plentifully upon their, or their antagonists. And in matters of set-apart importance, they deal out their anathemas in abundance upon Nazarene better than themselves. They denounce damnation upon their neighbors without either justice or mercy or right ruling and loving kindness. And when they pronounce sentences of Elohim's wrath against supposed heretics, they add their own man's fire and indignation. A dogmatist in religion is not a great way off from a bigot and is in high danger of growing up to be a bloody persecutor. Number 11. Though caution and slow ascent will guard you against frequent mistakes and retractions, yet you should get humility and courage enough to retract any mistake and confess any error. Frequent changes are tokens of long, or what is that? Frequent changes are tokens of levity in our first determinations, yet you should never be too proud to change your opinion nor frightened at the name of changeling. Learn to scorn those vulgar bugbears, which confirm foolish men in old mistakes for fear of being charged with inconstancy. I confess it is, no, or it is better not to judge than to judge falsely. It is more prudent to withhold our assent till we see complete evidence, but if we have too suddenly given up our assent, as the most prudent man does sometimes, if we have professed what we find afterwards to be false, we should never be ashamed nor afraid to renounce a mistake. That is a noble essay, which is found among the occasional papers to encourage the world to practice retractations. And I would recommend it to the perusal of every scholar and every Nazarene or believer. Rule number 12. He that would raise his judgment above the vulgar or common rank of mankind and learn to pass a righteous sentence on persons and things must take heed of a fanciful temper of mind and a humorous conduct in his affairs. Fancy and humor early and constantly indulged, may expect an old age overrun with follies. The notion of a, human, or a humorist is one that is greatly pleased or greatly displeased with little things, who sets his heart much upon matters of very small importance, who has his will determined every yom or day by trifles, his actions seldom directed by the reason and nature of things, and his passions frequently raised by things of little moment. Where this practice is allowed, it will insensibly warp the judgment to pronounce little things great and tempt you to lay a great weight upon them. In short, this temper will incline you to pass an unrighteous value on almost everything that occurs, and every step you take in this path is just so far out of the way to hokma or wisdom. Rule number 13. For the same reason, have a care of trifling with things important and monumentous, or of sporting with things awful and set apart. Do not indulge a ruach of ridicule, as some witty men do on all occasions and subjects. This will, as unhappily bias the judgment on the other side and incline you to pass a low esteem on the most valuable objects. Whatsoever evil habit we indulge in practice, it will insensibly obtain a power over our comprehension and betray us into many errors. Yokander is ready with his jest to answer everything that he hears. He reads books in the same jobble humor and has gotten the art of turning every thought and sentence into merriment. 
How many awkward and irregular judgments does this man pass upon solemn subjects, even when he designs to be grave and in earnest? His mirth and laughing humor is formed into habit and temper, and leads his comprehension shamefully astray. You will see him wandering in pursuit of a happy flying feather, and he is drawn by a sort of ignis fatuus or fatus into bogs and mire almost every yom or day of his existence. Rule number 14, ever maintain a virtuous and pious frame of ruach or spirit, for an indulgence of vicious inclinations debases the comprehension and perverts the judgment. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart and inner being and reason of a man. Sensuality ruins the better facilities of the mind or faculties of the mind, and indulgence to appetite and passion enfeebles the powers of reason. It makes the judgment weak and susceptible of every falsehood, and especially of such mistakes as have a tendency towards the gratification of the animal or carnal, and it wraps the inner being aside strangely from that steadfast honesty and integrity that necessarily belongs to the pursuit of truth. It is the virtuous man who is in a fair way to chokma or wisdom. Elohim gives to those that are tob in his sight chokma and knowledge and joy. Ecclesiastics 2, 26. Piety towards Elohim as well as sobriety and virtue, are necessary qualifications to make a truly prudent and judicious man. He that abandons religion must act in such a contradiction to his own conscience and best judgment that he abuses and spoils the faculty itself. It is thus the nature of things, and it is thus by the righteous judgment of Elohim even the pretended sages among the heathens who did not like to retain Elohim in their knowledge, they were given up to a reprobate mind, an undistinguishing, an injudicious mind, so that they judged inconsistently and practiced mere absurdities. Romans 1.28 And it is the character of the slaves of anti-Mashiach, 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and etc., that those who received not the love of the truth were exposed to the power of diabolical slights of, and lying wonders. When Elohim's revelation shines and blazes in the face of men with splendorous evidence, and they wink their eyes against it, the mighty one of this world is suffered to blind them, even in the most obvious, common, and sensible things. The great El of Shamayim, for this cause, sends them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. And the nonsense of transubstantiation in the popish world is a most glaring accomplishment of this foretelling beyond even what could have been thought of or expected among creatures who pretend to reason. Number 15. Watch against the pride of your own reason and a vain conceit of your own intellectual powers with neglect of Elohim's aid and biraka or blessing. Presume not upon great attainments and knowledge by your own self-sufficiency, those who trust to their own comprehension entirely are pronounced fools in the word of Elohim, and it is the most prudent of men gives them this character. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 27, or sorry, 28, 26. And the same L-inspired writer advises us to trust in Yahuwah with all our heart and not to lean on our own comprehensions, nor to be prudent in our own eyes, 
chapter 3, verse 5 and 7. Those who, with a neglect of religion and dependence on Elohim, apply themselves to search out every article in the things of Elohim by the mere dint of their own reason, have been suffered to run into wild excesses of foolery and strange extravagance of opinions. Everyone who pursues this vain course and will not ask for the conduct of El in the study of religion has right reason to fear he shall be left of Elohim and given up a prey to a thousand prejudices, that he shall be consigned over to the follies of his own heart and pursue his own temporal and eternal ruin. And even in common studies, we should, by humility and dependence, engage the L of truth on our side. Rule number 16. Offer up, therefore, your yamin, or daily request, to Elohim, the Father of lights, that he would barak all your attempts and labors in reading, study, and conversation. Think with yourself how easily and how insensibly, by one turn of thought, he can lead you into a large scene of useful ideas. He can teach you to lay hold on a clue which may guide your thoughts with safety and ease through all the difficulties of an intricate subject. Think how easily the author of your inner beings can direct your motions by his providence so that he or so that the glance of an eye or a word striking the ear or a sudden turn of the fancy shall conduct you to a train of happy sentiments. By his secret and supreme method of government, he can draw you to read such a trustees or converse with such a person who may give you more light into some deep subject in an hour than you could obtain by a month of your own solitary labor. Think with yourself with how much ease the L of Ruach Oath or spirits can cast into your minds some useful suggestion and give a happy turn to your own thoughts or the thoughts of those with whom you converse whence you may derive unspeakable light and satisfaction in a matter that has long puzzled and entangled you. He can show you a path which the vulture's eye has not seen and lead you by some unknown gate or portal out of the wilderness and labyrinth of difficulties wherein you have been long wandering. Implore constantly his L-breathed favor to point your inclination to proper studies and to fix your heart there. He can keep off temptations on the right hand and on the left, both by the course of his providence and by the secret and insensible imitations of his ruach or intimations, which is a word that means hints. He can guard your comprehension from every evil influence of error and secure you from the danger of evil books and men, which might otherwise have a fatal effect and lead you into pernicious mistakes. Nor let this sort of advice fall under the censor of the unrighteous and profane as a mere piece of bigotry or enthusiasm derived from belief in the scriptures. For the reasons which I have given to support this pious practice of invoking the Birak Oath of Elohim on our studies are derived from the light of nature as well as revelation. He that made our inner beings and is the Abba or father of Ruach Oath, shall he not be supposed to have a most friendly influence toward the instruction and government of them? The author of our rational powers can involve them in darkness when he pleases, by a sudden distemper, or he can abandon them to wander into dark and foolish opinions when they are filled with a vain conceit of their own light. He expects to be acknowledged in the common affairs of existence, 
and he does as certainly expected in the superior operations of the mind and in the search of knowledge and truth. The very Greek heathens, by the light of reason, were taught to say, ex dio something or other, but that means by Elohim's providence, possibly. And the Latins, a yo principium muse, which is the word for Joe, by the way. I like to take a digression here. This is often used for the name of a pagan mighty one. And I've just recently had the great pleasure of been studying a book in my free time called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And he goes into the etymology of a great many words through a, a variety of languages. It's a very wonderful study if you're interested in language. And in particular, you can see where the Hebrew words got put into the Greek names of false mighty ones left and right in literal titles of them. I don't want to go into too much detail, but it's a great confirmation of the historical reality of Hebrews intermixing with the sons of Yepheth and making the Greek peoples what they are today. So it's rather interesting. But to get back on point, Jove here is the Latin name originally for Yahuwah, the principal mighty one. And it was something that the Romans who were the sons of Zera that were survivors of Troy, but had become paganized, carried over into their language and place of staying at that point. If you can give me just one moment. Now, I don't recommend calling on the wrong names or doing anything like that, but I did find it rather significant. that This is another connection with his children being spread throughout the nations. In works of learning, they thought it necessary to begin with Elohim. Even the poets call upon the muse as a female mighty one to assist them in their compositions. The first lines of Homer in his Iliad and his Odyssey, the first line of Musaeus in his song of Hero and Lean. Leander, the beginning of Hisod in his poem of works and days, and several others furnish us with sufficient examples of this kind. Nor does Ovid, which means sheep in Latin, leave out this piece of devotion as he begins his stories of the metamorphosis. Nazarene so much the more obliges us by the precepts of scripture to invoke the assistance of the true Elohim in all our labors of the mind for the improvement of ourselves and others. Overseer Saunderson says that study without prayer is atheism as well as that prayer without study is presumption. And we are still more abundantly encouraged by the testimony of those who have acknowledged from their own experience that sincere prayer was no hindrance to their studies. They have gotten more knowledge sometimes upon their knees than by their labor in pursuing a variety of authors. And they have left this observation for such as follow. Beni orase est beni studici. Praying the best, or praying is the best studying. To conclude, let industry and devotion join together, and you will need not doubt the happy success. Proverbs 2, 2. Incline your ear to chokmah, applying your heart to comprehension. Cry after knowledge and lift up your voice. Seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures. Then shall you comprehend the fear of Yahuwah, and etc., which is the beginning of chokmah, or wisdom. And it is Yahuwah who gives chokmah, or wisdom, even to the simple, and out of his mouth comes knowledge and comprehension.
All right, and with that, I thank you all for your time, and we will have another video for chapter two. You have a wonderful day.